Well, welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to have you join us for our program today. Um, my name is Steve Weitzman, and um, it is my pleasure in my role as director of the Herbert D. Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania to welcome you to the 25th annual Joseph and Rebecca Meyerhoff program. We are really thrilled and honored to have, um, to be hosting our speaker today with you. Uh, but before we introduce her, I just want to say a few words about how the program is going to work and to express some words of appreciation. Um, the Meyerhoff program, the Meyerhoff lecture is a real highlight for the Katz Center every year. Uh, as some of you in the audience may know, the Katz Center runs a fellowship program that brings um, some 20 scholars to the Katz Center every year to work on research um, focused on a particular theme as it relates to Jewish studies. This year um, is actually the first of a two-year cycle focused on Jews and legal culture. Um, next year, we'll be, we'll be focused on Jews and modern legal culture, but this year we've been focused on Jews and pre-modern legal culture, which encompasses topics uh, ranging from the study of law in the Hebrew Bible to rabbinic literature to medieval and early modern literature. And we've assembled from around the world um, just a, a stellar roster of scholars who share an interest uh, in this topic. And I'm, I'm really delighted that this year has been in person. The Meyerhoff lecture gives us a chance to broaden the circle of our fellowship cohort um, to include, first of all, a wonderful guest scholar that you'll be meeting in a few minutes, um, but also um, you, the members of our audience, the broader public um, out there in the world. And I think we have audience members here from all over the world. Um, it's a chance to bring you into the conversation that the fellows are having over the course of the year. Um, and we're delighted to have you join us. I wanna just take a moment to acknowledge uh, the two co-sponsors that have made this program possible. The first is Penn's history department. And the second is Penn's Jewish studies program under the, director, under, under the directorship of Catherine Hellerstein. And we are grateful to both units uh, for making this program possible together with us. Um, just a few notes, practical notes about how the program is going to work. And then um, we're going to be uh, actually putting into practice a tradition that we have with the Meyerhoff lecture. Um, probably many of you are familiar now with the webinar format. We're going to be having the talk run for about 40, 45 minutes, after which we will have time for discussion. Um, and your questions and comments are very welcome as part of that discussion. So you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to um, submit questions or comments. Um, you can do that um, during the lecture. You can do it after the lecture. And um, when the lecture is done, um, there will appear on the screen our Director of Public Programs, Dr. Ann Albert, who is a fantastic moderator of discussions. And she will be calling from your comments and questions, reading them on your behalf. And we will have uh, something of a conversation with our um, special guests uh, this afternoon after the lecture. Um, just a word or two about the Meyerhoff lecture. Um, the lecture was established to honor the memory of Joseph and Rebecca Meyerhoff, who were leading philanthropists whose generosity extended to Jewish learning and scholarship, as well as to music, the arts, and, the humani and various humanitarian causes. Beyond what their generosity has made possible, the Meyerhoffs also helped create a family that is very special to the Katz Center. Herbert D. Katz, for whom the Katz Center is named, was the husband of the Meyerhoff's daughter, Eleanor. And Eleanor and Herb's son, Tom Katz, is a longtime member of the center's advisory board, a former chair of that board, and pretty much the most ideal supporter and participant and citizen in the Katz Center that one could hope for. So our tradition with the uh, Meyerhoff program is to actually ask Tom to say a few words of welcome. And so with that, I wanna turn the virtual stage over to him. Steve, thank you uh, so very much. I really appreciate uh, the, your, your very, very kind uh, introduction. Um, the, uh, as Steve mentioned, the uh, Meyerhoff Lecture was established by my mother's uh, family uh, in honor of my father becoming the chair of the uh, Cat Center a number of years ago. 
but far more important than a well-deserved uh, honor for a, an important milestone in uh, my father's life and the Katz family's lives uh, is that the Meyerhoff Lecture is the opportunity to firmly place the Katz Center and its programs in the broader uh, academic uh, interests of the university and even beyond that to make sure that there is an important voice that can be heard for the community uh, at large. Uh, and so we are uh, so deeply appreciative, not only to uh, those who are uh, participating today uh, it, or on this panel uh, and uh, our fellows who you'll meet in a moment, uh, but also to all of you uh, who are uh, attending by Zoom uh, because your mere attendance uh, says that uh, the vision that uh, they thought possible uh, on the establishment of the Meyerhoff Lecture uh, has indeed come to uh, fruition. Uh, it is uh, my uh, honor to uh, introduce uh, to you uh, Rita Copeland, uh, who is the Shelley Z and Burton X. Rosenberg Professor of the Humanities and Penn's Departments of Classics, English, and Comparative Literature. Uh, like uh, our uh, uh, lecturer today, Elie Sheva Baumgarten, she, Rita is a uh, former fellow uh, at the uh, Katz uh, Center. Uh, and uh, what is really important and special for me uh, personally is that uh, more than uh, being just uh, fellows, um, they uh, represent well the fellowship that is uh, the Cat Center family. Uh, and so with that, I, I thank everyone for uh, attending. And like you, uh, I look forward to the remarks today. And now Rita. I'm very pleased to be here. Elisheva Baumgarten is a Yitzhak Becker Professor of Jewish Study in the Department of Jewish Studies and Contemporary Jewry and in the Department of History at the Hebrew University. She began her career with a justly famous book on mothers and children and Jewish family life in medieval Europe. If motherhood and childhood had long been subject without a history, Elisheva's work has transformed the subject into a definitive historical field whose methods are clearly marked. She's at the leading edge of a new generation of social historians who bring pre-modern family life and the lives of ordinary people to the surface, training raw data into sensitive historical narratives. She's a historian of practice, the practice of piety among ordinary laity in medieval Ashkenaz, which is the subject of her 2014 book published by UPenn Press. The daily social intimacies between Jews and Christians in medieval Europe. The shared knowledges of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And the mixtures of animosity and cooperation with their neighbors that defined medieval Jewish life on the ground. She's published six books and countless articles, and she is the recipient of many fellowships including from the Center for Advanced Judaic Studies at Penn, the Israel Institute of Advanced Studies, the IAS in Princeton, the Rothschild Foundation, the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, the Israel Science Foundation, and the European Research Council. I want to dwell for a moment on this last, the funding that she won from the ERC for her project Beyond the Elite, Jewish Daily Life in Medieval Europe. This is a team research project based at the Mount Scopus campus of Hebrew University, hosting conferences and exchanges and supporting graduate and postgraduate researchers. This major grant from a prestigious funding agency recognizes not only Elisheva's groundbreaking scholarship, but her dynamic leadership. And she has expressed that dynamism by making Beyond the Elite true to its name using it as a platform for continuous and creative public outreach. I got to know Elisheva during the year that we spent at the Cat Center together, the 2012-2013 seminar topic on 13th century Judaism. 
Any of you who know Elisheva will agree that she uses her formidable learning and her passionate intellectual commitments to the most constructive ends, asking imaginative and acute questions and finding commonalities among the most disparate interests. Her partnerships with the CAT Center go back a very long way and continue strong today. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Elisheva Baumgarten, who will give the 2022 Meyerhoff Lecture in Judaic Studies with the title, Legal Knowledge and Everyday Practice in Medieval Ashkenaz. Uh, good evening to everyone. I want to begin by thanking my host tonight, Dr. Steve Weitzman, Director of the CAT Center for Advanced Judaic Studies, and Dr. Natalie Dorman, Associate Director, and also express my thanks to Tom Katz and the Katz family and Dr. Rita Copeland. A thanks in advance to the audience. I'm already looking forward to your questions. It is always good to be back at Penn, even in a virtual mood. It is a privilege to be speaking as part of this fellowship year, rethinking pre-modern Jewish culture and to be giving the Meyerhoff annual lecture. My talk tonight will examine the social history of a legal institution, marriage, among the Jews of medieval Ashkenaz in the high Middle Ages. More specifically, I will discuss the creation of marriages. In English, we use the word legal to express activities related to and governed by the law. And most of us who study pre-modern Jews often translate the word legal into the word halachic, when discussing Jewish law. However, halakha or halachic are not synonymous with law and legal. Despite this in my talk tonight, as in the work of many Jewish studies scholars, I will be using these terms quite synonymously. The Penn Fellowship Group is studying legal culture, a term that also has many meanings, often connected to courts and their workings or to the scholarly composition and interpretation of the law, but also a term that can be applied to aspects of society at large. My talk tonight will seek to situate marriage, a legal institution par excellence, within the daily lives and practices of medieval Jews. These will be my guiding questions. What knowledge did most members of Jewish society have of halacha? What agency did they have vis-a-vis -vis the halacha? And how did they negotiate the legal systems at play in their society? And what was the power of law or halacha in medieval Ashkenazic Jewish legal culture? Marriage is a useful case study in my eyes because the legality of marriage is a central feature of the institution. If one is not married legally, one is not married. As such, this is a classic topic for legal studies. But marriage is also a social institution and it is the intersection between the social and the legal that I am seeking tonight. I would argue that the Jews of medieval Ashkenaz are excellent for my purposes tonight. I am speaking tonight about the Jews of medieval Germany and Northern France. They are an interesting example, both because they are known for their halachic writings and for the impression they left on the world of Jewish learning until this very day, but also because they have been viewed by modern scholars as especially devout and pious, with an emphasis on the name they often called themselves, Kihilak Dosha, a holy community, and on their observance of the law. Because many of the texts that have survived from these communities, and certainly those in Hebrew are legal texts, they have also been one of the most central study, sources studied. As a result, a central enterprise of modern scholars has been the history of halacha and of the heroes of halachic writings, the legal decisors, the poskim who wrote these sources. And you have just a short, a small example of these recent studies on the screen. Over the past decades, and certainly from the time of Jacob Katz and onward, scholars have mined these halachic sources to create a social history, translating prescriptive writings into evidence of practice and featuring the lives of the rabbis as representative of Jews of the time at large. To provide just one example, Avraham Grossman estimated the average number of children in medieval Ashkenazic families based on the number of children the rabbis had. In contrast, my own work, specifically over the past years, has sought to move the focus away from the rabbinic authors who have been seen both as the possessors of knowledge and as ideal types for all Ashkenazic Jews. Recent work on tombstones has demonstrated that at most 10% of the members of Jewish communities 
were part of the rabbinic elite. My current research project, Beyond the Elite, Jewish Daily Life in Medieval Europe, focuses on the other 90 to 95% of the communities. The first part of my research title expresses the desire to get away from those who wrote the texts, among them legal texts, and have been viewed as typical. My use of the phrase beyond the elite expresses the difficulty inherent in this goal, since the majority of sources that have reached us were written by elites. If not the rabbinic elite, then the local Christian elites, and as a result, we can strive to get beyond them, but this is not a simple task. Everyday life is central in my work, as it provides a corrective to the topic of many historical studies, crises, or turning points in history. Traditional historiography has emphasized not only people in positions of authority rather than those who were not part of the elite, but also has drawn attention to moments of change rather than continuity. Together with my team that Rita mentioned, that includes postdocs, doctoral, and master students, we highlight the everyday, seeking to outline recurring patterns and understand the mundane alongside the unusual. I emphasize that this is a joint endeavor because I will be quoting some of my students' work tonight, and also because I believe that much of what I have done over the past years would be impossible without them. The relationship between law and everyday history poses interesting complexities. On the one hand, the law served as a necessary foundation for the functioning of everyday culture. Indeed, the law played an enormous role in determining the everyday. At the same time, many laws were put in place for when the quotidian was disrupted, when people did not play by the rules. Yet more importantly, the shift to everyday life is, from my perspective, a move away from a social history deduced from halachic sources that characterized previous generations of scholars to a focus on everyday life based on multiple genres. To explain this, let me turn to the sources I will be presenting tonight. The first part of my talk will begin with traditional methods of studying literature. Legal formulations and legal texts in my case tonight, mainly response to literature. Then I will discuss other types of sources, literary tales, material culture, a different kind of legal text, municipal regulations, and finally, astrological formula. I will conclude by outlining how I believe the inclusion of multiple genres changed the way we understand the place of the law in everyday life. And in our case tonight, medieval marriage. So let us turn to the creation of marriage in medieval Ashkenaz. Jewish legal literature, first and foremost, the Mishnah and Talmud, use a number of actions to create a marriage. Marriage had two parts. One second. A Rusin or Kiddushin betrothal and Nusuin, which was marriage. In late antiquity and well into medieval Ashkenaz, these were sometimes two separate stages, separated by days, weeks, or months. We also have the act of agreeing upon a marriage called Shiduchin. The text I will be dealing with tonight focus first and foremost on the betrothal, on Erusin or Kiddushin, and also mention the Shiduchin, the agreement on the match. Medieval legal formulations were based on ancient ones, primarily the Mishnah or the Talmud, where it is stated, for example, a man can betroth his daughter when she is a young woman, by himself or by his agent, or as stated elsewhere, it is prohibited for a person to betroth his daughter when she is a minor until she grows up and says, I want so-and-so. Or in a different case, the sage is taught a person should always sell all he has to marry the daughter of a Torah scholar. If he cannot find the daughter of a Torah scholar, he should marry the daughter of one of the great people of his generation. If he cannot find the daughter of one of the great people, etc., then he should marry the next person in line. All these statements suggest a clear gender hierarchy, men betrothing and marrying women and fathers making decisions for their daughters. Scholars have read these statements as a kind of when fathers ruled, embellished by assumptions that such unions created by fathers were also hard to dismantle because of fears for the yichus, the lineage that we just saw in this last source that was so important. Staying within the remit of classic halachic literature, let us turn to a first medieval example, a halachic question sent by the 13th century rabbi, Isaac ben Moshe, the author of Sefer or Zerua of Vienna, to his teacher, Rabbi Simcha of Speyer, Isaac subsequently sent the question and Simcha's answers to two of his contemporaries. This responsum um, seeks advice regarding an occurrence that took place in two towns, Jirka and Nitra, located in today's Slovakia, and at the time, part of the Kingdom of Hungary. If you look at this map, you could see that this question really spanned 
all of the Jewish settlement known in Europe at the time, or at least in Northern Europe. The story can be read as evidence of rabbinic authority involving so many Jews from so many different places. I will quote parts of this question and summarize others. Once there was a Jew who lived in Jirka, who agreed upon the marriage of his son to the daughter of another Jew who lived in Nitra. And after the match was agreed upon, the mother of the man from Jirka sent a belt to the woman with Reuben um, as a gift. And the young man sent a ring with Reuben to betroth her. We see in the story how they use the halachic language we just saw in the Mishnah and the Talmud, two fathers deciding for their children. However, the next line, the second line of the story that we see here before us already has two additional actors, the mother of the groom and the groom himself who are sending gifts to the bride using a messenger that the responsa calls Reuben. The ring and the belt were to be delivered by a messenger and Reuben arrived in the prospective bride's town and lodged with Shimon. Shimon went to the city street, Rehovair, perhaps meaning the marketplace, and found two Jews who could serve as witnesses. Together, these four men went to the young woman's home to present her with the gifts. What we have here is a practice we saw in the Mishnah just a moment ago on my slide, betrothing a woman by means of a messenger or marriage by proxy. Such marriages were also a common phenomena in medieval Europe, especially among nobility and royalty. But unlike the Mishnah that presented a father and a daughter and a messenger, here we can see multiple actors. Reuven and Shimon arrived with the gifts and Shimon told the young woman, here is the belt the man's mother sent to you, take it. And she did not want to take it. And she also hid her face from looking at them. And another woman took the belt from Shimon. The responsum continues. Then Shimon took out the ring and said to the young woman, here is the ring that the man sent to you, to betroth you. And she did not respond because she covered her face and she did not look at them. And the other woman took the ring from Shimon like she had taken the belt and no person heard her, the bride, tell Shimon to give it to her, to the other woman. As anyone familiar with legal procedure immediately realizes, these are not valid kiddushin. This young woman whose age is not mentioned, but whom I would suggest was not a minor, did not accept the ring or acknowledge the gift. It is evident here that she did not tell the other woman to take the gifts for her, nor did anyone tell Shimon to give the other woman the gifts. Isaac, who circulated this question, explains that as a result of this event, the young woman gained a reputation, Yetzal Hashem, in her hometown and in other places, and she was considered betrothed. In other words, she was not able to marry. The response continues with a discussion of the legality of Reuben's deeds. Reuben was a messenger, a practice allowed by Jewish law, but in this case, it was not he himself who delivered the ring or the gift, but Shimon, who was not appointed as a messenger by the groom. Moreover, he did not have a document, a star, that declared him the messenger of the groom. Other legal issues concerning proxies and witnesses are discussed at length within the responsum, referencing a number of Talmudic discussions. The responsum concludes with Isaac asking his rabbi, Rabbi Simcha, whether or not these are valid kiddushin. He explains that the woman did not accept the ring in her hand, Moreover, the witness testified that Shimon did not state the standard formula, you are hereby betrothed, harayat mekudeshetli, when he handed it over, nor did the bride acquiesce. However, Isaac also expresses a concern that maybe she had agreed early to the match, in which case she had agreed to the marriage. Her reputation as a woman who had been betrothed was also a concern. What was to be done with this rumor? Simchav Speyer's answer is short. He asserts that even if the match had been agreed upon, if someone else accepted the ring for the bride, this other person had no right to do so. And therefore there was no reason to fear a union had been formed. However, rather than declare this young bride free of any connection to her groom, Rabbi Simcha finishes his response with a somewhat different suggestion. He states, if you can convince her to marry him, it would be better him. And if she wants to marry an Israelite, let her accept a divorce writ, and if not, no good will become will come of forbidding a Cohen to marry her. And this rumor does not need to be negated since it is worthless and it is disqualified. Let me repeat what we just saw. Rabbi Simcha acknowledges that this woman is not betrothed, the correct formula was not recited, the gift was not given or accepted properly. He also dismisses the rumor, a topic often central in halachic deliberations and indeed central in medieval judicial considerations of the period at large. 
Rabbi Isaac's peers, to whom he sent the correspondence with Rabbi Simcha, tell Isaac there are no grounds to insist that this woman needs a divorce in order to marry. Why then does Rabbi Isaac want to confirm that this could be considered a valid marriage? Why is he not following what seems to be a clear legal solution? And why does Rabbi Simcha, who's convinced these are not valid kiddushin, suggest that if this woman could be convinced to marry the man and then divorce him, this would be preferred? Looking through legal responsa from medieval Ashkenaz, one discovers this is not a rare case. For example, cases of kiddushin schok, betrothals made in jest, can be found quite frequently in the rabbinic responsa literature. My student, Dr. Eyal Levinson, has written about some of these cases at length in his forthcoming book. In many of these cases, men, sometimes drunk men, hand women rings, and the women often throw the rings on the ground so as to refuse accepting them. Nevertheless, their communities consider them betrothed, and these rumors prevent their subsequent marriages. Let me recall my guiding questions. What was the knowledge of halacha? What agency and negotiation did people have? What was the power of the law? We see that this young woman from Hungary or Slovakia, like some of the women discussed by Eyal in his work, whether on their own or thanks to the counsel of someone else, were familiar with legal procedure. The young woman in Rabbi Isaac's responsa knew to refuse the gift she was being offered. Other women, as I said, are reported as throwing the rings given to them to the ground. Society around them also had its own understandings. They considered these women betrothed, and as a result, they would not allow them to marry others. No less importantly, we also see that the rabbis, most clearly Simcha of Speyer, did not expect their decisions to be easily followed, and that Isaac was actually asking a question that was far from intuitive. If rabbis ruled and halacha set the tone of medieval Ashkenaz, as scholars have often assumed, why was there a need to counsel a rapid marriage and divorce? And why did both women, why did these women's communities insist they were betrothed when legally they were not? I would suggest that rather than consider the halachic logic behind the responses here, the path that has most often been followed in cases such as these, the spotlight should be trained on material culture. Belts and rings featured prominently in the case discussed by Isaac Orzarua, and in fact were standard parts of marriage rituals. Often they were part of the gifts exchanged as part of the agreements between families concerning marriage known as sivlonot. If we look at this medieval illumination here, we can see this very well. This is the wedding of Moses and Zipporah in a 15th century Haggadah. But you can see the belt she is wearing here and the ring being held up by the groom on the way to her finger. Dr. Ido Noy, a member of my research team, has demonstrated in his work the extent to which such belts were common love tokens and rings symbolize marriage, not only among Jews, but also among Christians. And you can see an example of such a belt here um, with the Latin words of love conquering everything, Jews had these belts as well. They've been found in the Erfurt treasure, and you can see the belts and the rings here in this picture before you. The belts were inscribed with declarations of love, and Jews used the same rings and belts. Looking to the Christian environment, one also discovers that a common way of enacting marriage was the giving of a ring. For example, the 11th century German courtly novel Rudlieb describes a knight who set out to seek his fortune. In one of the scenes, Rudlieb's nephew's marriage is performed after this young man played a game of dice and won his beloved. In this case, after the mother of the bride acquiesces to the marriage, we hear that the betrothed drew his sword and wedded it against the pillar and the golden ring was fixed on its hilt. I'm sorry, something jumped here on my slide. And the betrothed offered it to the bride saying to her, just as the ring surrounds the whole finger, so I bind you with firm and enduring troth, and this you must give me or lose your head. Accepting the ring, this young bride is granted many other gifts. Returning to the halachic responsa, we can see a possible context that explains the understanding that these women were married far more accurately than halachic norms. Put differently, it would seem that the community's insistence on the validity of the marriage was not halacha or law in any way. Rather, this was an accepted convention shared by Jews and Christians alike. In fact, up until the Reformation, Christian authorities often dealt with similar cases in which the giving of a ring was considered a valid marriage, and many would have considered a couple married after a ring changed hands, even if the formula that were required for Christian marriage were not recited. How did people gain such knowledge? 
For example, how did the young Jewish woman who refused the ring and the belt know to behave in this way? I would argue that an important source for understanding this process of education is stories and tales. My forthcoming book um, discusses the extent to which biblical stories and new understandings of them inform daily practice and was shaped by it. And here too, I would point to stories told by medieval Jews and Christians as crucial for better understanding how different legal and social norms were embedded within everyday life. Let me note that I am not proposing reading legal texts using literary methods, as many scholars have done over the past years, but in reading literature and seeing what traces of legal knowledge can be found in it. Rudely, the tale we just saw an excerpt from was considered a didactic tale. A similar example can be found in the story of Du Courant, one of the earliest Yiddish tales there is evidence for, and this tale was found on a slate in Cologne from before 1349. In this tale, like in Rudlieb, Horant grants a golden ring to a maiden in order to seal a pact of love and commitment between them. My example for today comes from a similar specimen, but in Hebrew, a 13th century collection of stories from Northern France known as Sefer HaMaasim. This book is called as such because of the word Maase that starts every tale. One of the tales is a story known as Chulda Uvor, the weasel and the cistern in Hebrew writings. The story explains a passage in the Talmud that discusses people who are ba'alei emuna, or people of faith, who merit the downfall of rain. Using a verse from Psalms, the eyes of the God will be upon the faithful of the land. And the Gemara says as follows. Rabbi Ami said, come and see how great the faithful people are. From where is this derived? From the weasel, the chulda, and the cistern, the boar. And if this is the outcome for one who believes in a cistern and a weasel, all the more so for one who has faith in the Holy One, blessed be he. The Talmud does not explain what this story is all about, but in Rashi's commentary on the Talmud and in Sefer Ha'aruch by Rabbi Natan, son of Yechiel from Rome, this story is expanded. Some scholars have suggested that the tale that Rashi and Rabbi Natan choose to tell originated already in late antiquity, but there is little proof of this. In the story, a young man and woman pledge themselves to each other. This happens after the young woman, a kind of medieval Jewish Red Riding Hood, is walking to her mother's home, adorned with silver and gold rather than a red cape. She falls into a cistern. From this point on, the story turns from fairy tale to far more realistic. She is pulled out of the cistern by a young man who immediately wants to rape her. Very interestingly, she stops him using procedure. She asked him, what people are you from? He replied, I am from Israel, and I am from such and such a place, and I am a Kohen. Basically, what he is saying is, I am a Jew from a specific place. His being a Kohen of priestly descent is thrown into the mix to accentuate how inappropriate what he wants to do is. She says to him, a holy people such as yours, and God has chosen you from all of Israel and sanctified you, and you wish to behave like an animal without Kiddushin and without a Ketubah? In her words, we hear both custom and law. She is establishing their legal identities and the need for public recognition of their union. She continues. Follow me to my fathers and mothers and I will become engaged to you. In other words, marriage and the decision to marry must take place in local parentis. The next part of the story builds off procedure, although unlike this first exchange, does not quite follow it. They made a covenant with one another. He said to her, who will be the witness between you and me? And a weasel happened to pass by before them. He said to her, the heavens and the weasel and the cistern will be witnesses. Undoubtedly, these are very unusual witnesses, but the two exchanged their vows and parted ways. The story continued with the girl keeping her word and refusing all the matches she was offered. That girl stood fast to her vow and anyone who came to claim her hand in marriage, she would refuse. Because she was being coerced to marry by her parents, she began to behave as if she were mad and had seizures and she tore her clothes and the clothes of anyone who tried to touch her until all people avoided her. In other words, her parents put pressure on her to marry someone and she began to behave as if she was crazy in order to ward off any of these attempts. The man in contrast went back to his hometown, married another woman and had two sons. These two sons died, the one bitten by a weasel and the other fell into a cistern. The man's wife, the woman who he married, instead of the one who he made a vow to, 
questioned the improbable fate that befell both her sons, and after some persuasion, heard her husband's story and divorced him. Then he goes to look for the woman to whom he had made the promise. He was told she is possessed and she does such and such to anyone who seeks her hand. He went to her father and told him the entire story. And he said to her, he said to him, I'm sorry, I accept her with all of her faults. He brought witnesses and she began to act as she always did. And he told her about the weasel and his sister. She said to him, I also kept my promise and immediately returned to sanity. And they were fruitful and multiplied with children and wealth. I've heard the Bible says, and so the story concludes, the eyes of God will be upon the faithful of the land. That was the verse we saw in the Talmud and the verse with which the story concludes. This story has been studied by folklorists and used by authors in literature, most famously by Shai Agnon in the story of Tehillah. But I, what, what I want to underline is how legal standards and social practices are presented here. For example, the declaration, I accept her with all her faults, is that which is needed when one marries another person physically or mentally impaired. If one does not know about these pre-existing issues, the knowledge later on could be grounds for divorce. The procedure of such an announcement is also noted here with witnesses coming, etc., in a scene that mirrors the oath taken earlier in the story. Yet here too, as before, we see how the lawful interpretation of the events is not followed. An invalid oath was taken by two people by a cistern. The man continued with his life and legally should not have been considered bound to his permit. Yet he was sent a message from heaven that he had done wrong with the death of his sons and ultimately their mother's demand for divorce. To some extent, my two examples concerning marriage, the legal and the literary, provide interesting mirrors for each other. The case discussed by Isaac Orzarua is a learned rabbinic response that requires Talmudic knowledge just to follow the details in question. But what people thought, reputations that had been established, even if they were erroneous and had no legal basis, prevailed. In the Ma'asad, the tale, as a way to avoid rape, the young woman calls upon procedure using an oath that did not meet any legal standards. The illegality of what followed, the betrayal of the oath, led to death, divorce, and finally a happy end replete with legal formalities. I think these two examples demonstrate one aspect of what has been called by studies, by scholars, I'm sorry, studying the non-elite in Christian society, the least of the lady. We see that non-elite people are portrayed as possessing basic legal knowledge. At the same time, both examples demonstrate the limitations of the law and of the legal logic in a way that exhibits the importance of broader understandings of the social order and of institutions within which the law was situated. I want to be clear. I am not arguing the law is unimportant. It is a fundamental necessary cornerstone of society. What I am arguing is that it is not sufficient. Reading both the Hebrew tale and the responsa, one feels within a completely Jewish world. And in fact, Jewish marriage is most often seen as part of an internal Jewish world with halakha being the driving force behind procedure and custom. Yet Jews lived in medieval Christian urban spaces, not in a vacuum. Although marriage by definition could not join a Jew and a Christian, other regulations impacted on how Jewish marriage was created. Let me give two brief examples. From the early 14th century and on, in different locations, especially in Germany, we find stipulations regarding Jewish marriage in municipal legislation. For example, in Goslar in 1312, the council determined on an individual basis what the rights of settlement for each family were. Samson, his son Moses, their wives and all their unmarried children were granted permission to live in Goslar as burghers. However, this permit states, the council grants full legal status to all members of the family, but if they marry off their sons and daughters, they must negotiate separately with the council for their continued stay after the marriage. These same instructions are found in Goslar for different families repeatedly. The marriage of their children was not just subject to halakha, but also to local limitations. Dr. Andreas Lenhardt, Lenhardt, a member of my research team, has recently documented how sometimes children in the same family were split. Some were considered burghers or citizens, others were not, and this impacted where they could live and the business they could conduct. Urban legislation given to the entire Jewish community and not specific families also shows similar trends. For example, from December 1329, in Cologne. When a Jew or a Jewess comes to Cologne and marries there, she may live in the city without being obliged to pay any fee or tax to us. There are many other examples of such regulations. 
These sources indicate that marriage was far from a personal decision. It had far reaching consequences for the family, the community, and significant financial implications. These regulations pertaining to Jews are also fascinating for what they tell of Jewish belonging. 14th century legal evidence indicates that Jews were more regularly part of urban legal systems than previously believed by scholars. I cannot expand upon this point now, but I think the lack of attention to these sorts of regulations in all discussions of Jewish marriage to date is a lacuna that distorts our understanding of marriage as an institution. In other words, marriage was only between Jews, but to understand marriage, we need the Jewish Christian context. Focusing, as we have on legality, one sometimes forgets emotions. But of course, these existed as well. And we can see them between the lines in the text that I have shown you tonight. The refusal of the daughter to accept the ring and the belt. The fright of the woman about to be raped by the well. The dismay of parents whose daughter refused every match. The tension between Jewish families and local authorities when determining taxes and rights, or the ferocity of rumors that determine the freedom to marry. We have seen many emotions between the lines in the sources we looked at tonight. Another nice example of the place of emotions can be found in the personal notebook of one Tosafist, also known for his erudition, Isaac ben Isaac of Chinon, who lived in Northern France during the 13th century. Recently, one of my students, Amit Chafran, has worked on parts of this tiny manuscript that was his personal sidur. This sidur was already studied decades ago by Colette Sira and includes prayers, incantations, other texts, and among them, a very interesting formula for determining whether a couple considering marriage would be blessed with good fortune. The formula involves the position of the stars as well as gematria, numerology. This was a common way of determining fortunes among Jews as well as Christians and is known from late antiquity. Here is perhaps the most practical tip I can give you tonight in my talk to know if you married the right person. So to know whether a certain man will marry a certain woman and what will be their fate if he will marry her, go and calculate his name along with hers and add to the amount 16 and take out nine again and nine again. And if the remainder is nine, he won't marry her. And if he will marry her, they will not succeed. And if it is two, the sign of Venus, it is good, redemption and pleasure will be between them. And if the sign of Mars, bad luck, hate and fighting and jealousy will be between them. And three, that is hate, etc. So whatever the result is of this numerology, you can figure out if the match will be successful. If we imagine parents looking for a match for their daughter or a woman refusing a match suggested by her parents, we can imagine these different people checking out their proposed match with a formula of this sort. The formula would determine if they would be happy, love each other, have the ability to make a living, etc. What was the influence of such an inquiry on their decision to marry? How did the importance attributed to such fortunes compare to rabbis' pronouncements that, rabbi, that marriages were valid or invalid? Throughout this talk, I have attempted to situate the legal within the social rather than deduce the social from the legal has, as has often been done to date. In lieu of a summary, I want to point to some of the implications in my eyes of this approach. Returning to the traditional approach to legal sources with which I began, I would point first of all to the danger of reading the legal text too literally. The phrasing based on the Mishnah, which many scholars use because that was the language they had before them to describe the cases they were educating is misleading. We saw the stories do not tell us only of fathers who determined their children's marriages. We saw children who challenged their parents' desires. Young women and men had minds of their own. Sometimes they made these choices on their own. Following the legal language, modern assumptions about patriarchy have allowed fathers an even greater role than they had in reality. People had agency. Just because the ling legal language was a man betrothed his daughter and medieval writers used this language, this does not mean this was how couples found each other and decided to wed. This agency allowed medieval people to negotiate multiple systems of belief and power, be them astronomy, numerology, rumors, or law. At the same time, this wasn't because of lack of knowledge. We saw that individuals were quite familiar with marriage procedure and legal details. So another takeaway is that we can allow non-specialists more knowledge of the law than scholarship has to date. Another more general idea that follows has to do with the rabbis themselves. Rabbi Isaac of Shinon and his formula provide an example of the multiple registers that all medieval people, including legal decisors, worked in. 
Isaac is known for his erudition in the law, but his sidur with personal prayers and a formula for determining the success of a match reveals a consideration that was perhaps no less important than legal ones. On a deeper level, the response we started with, written by Isaac ben Moshe, author of Sefer Or Zeruah, and answered by Simcha of Speyer, is an example of both the power of legal decisors, this question spanned all of Europe, and the lack of consequence of legal guidelines. The rabbi's opinion was sought from far away, but the respondents to the halachic question also acknowledged the limits of their power. They knew the kiddushin were not valid, but also knew that local convention affirmed them. And that is why Rabbi Simcha suggested an alternative, having the young woman marry and divorce. Here we can see how consumers of law had purposes other than justice or proper procedure in mind when calling on the law. Finally, all these parameters need to be considered in the context of the spaces within which Jews lived, and first and foremost, within the medieval Christian environment. Take the case of the ring. According to the halacha, the ring transferring hands on its own did not create a marriage. Yet in Germanic tradition, it did, as it did among some Christians. Halacha interacted with local practices and took it into account as well. And it is here that material culture leads the way for us. Let me conclude by saying something personal. I began my work 20 years ago, thinking that halachic literature was the key corpus that could lead to a social historical understanding of medieval Ashkenaz. Today, I would argue that legal literature is important, but it is best studied in conjunction with other sources and with the understanding that it was but one aspect of larger social institutions, beliefs, and norms. Multiple genres, as you see here on the screen in front of you, must be part of our historical quest to understand how individuals negotiated the systems at play in medieval society. For medieval people, like modern people today, were complex human beings who functioned on multiple registers. Their thinking, even if they were devout Jews who followed halacha, was not always halachic. It is time to make this understanding a central factor in our path to better understand the path, the past. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Elisheva. That was wonderful. We do have questions starting to come in, and I just want to encourage anyone who is thinking them over to start um, start putting them in the Q and A for us. So I'm going to give um, pride of first question to our host, Steve Weitzman. Um, who has asked if you might talk a little bit more about rumor. So um, in particular, how it moves from social worlds into legal contexts. Um, he points out that it seems to have a kind of legal weight of its own. And if that's the case, then why and on what grounds? And um, on the other hand, is that based on a kind of faulty legal notion? So what's going on there in the interaction between law and rumor? Also, rumor seems gendered. Is that so? And uh, maybe that constitutes some kind of female agency. What can you say about that? Okay, so thank you for that question. I'll say two or three different things. So the first thing I'll say is that there's been a lot of writing on rumor over the past years. I'll mention the book Fama that was edited by Dan Smale and other work on the topic. And rumor became a factor in medieval judicial processes that it was not in earlier periods, or at least so some scholars of medieval European culture have been claiming. Actually, tonight, I wasn't talking about that. In other words, that was not my point tonight. So uh, for scholars of judicial practice and of the law, the place of rumor in medieval Europe is really a very important question. And it would be interesting to compare that to the place of rumor in halacha. I'll mention the work of Rami Reiner in his recent book on Rabbeinu Tam. He writes about that very beautifully in the context of gitin, in the context of divorce, and whether rumor has it or doesn't have it that the husband wanted to give a divorce, didn't want to give a divorce, and other questions of that sort. And he's very worried about people who will spread rumors like this and cause a lot of trouble, trouble and really wreak havoc within families and the decisions they're making. What was interesting to me in the case I was talking about tonight is that nobody talks about that. In other words, we don't have these legal de deliberations of what this rumor was. It's just kind of a fact. And we know that these rumors are going around. And I should also note that this young woman from Hungary was probably stuck um, for quite some while not being able to get married because of these rumors. Um, and I've encountered these kinds of rumors in other cases as well. For example, um, in cases of uh, children found on the street, um, people say, well, that's the son of this woman who lives over there and she abandoned her son. And we have a rumor as well that's kind of circulating about who this child is and what's going on. So we have a lot of rumors out there. I um, mean, I think we need to study this more. 
Um, I actually have a graduate student who's about to start and would really like to look at this in his work. So I'm looking forward um, to some of what he'll find. Gendered, I might say that rumors are gendered in two ways. There often are rumors about women and these rumors can really mess up their lives like we saw in the case tonight and in other cases of um, these kind of these marriages in jest, these um, uh, marriages that women didn't necessarily wanna be part of um, when a ring was thrown at them or put on their finger and they kind of were victims of circumstance. Um, my student Eyal has a great case that happens at a bar in the 14th century in Erfurt. So we have a case like that as well. Uh, but I think rumors were also something women could spread. But I would have to say that most often in the halachic response that I'm familiar with, it's usually rumors about the women and not rumors that women are spreading. So that's where I'd leave it now. And I think that's a great question and it requires uh, more research and it's really a wonderful avenue for exploration. Okay, so maybe following up on that a little bit, um, I'll pass on to you a question from Rita Copeland, who asked um, to talk a little more about the context for hearing, reading, and knowing stories, especially for women. So what is the relationship between rumor and stories, um, if there are things that are being told? On the one hand, that's my addition. And, and Rita asks, were these women readers? Were they hearers of stories, tellers of stories? What's the role of literacy and other forms of passing stories along? Okay, so I'm going to thank you for that question. I'm going to say something that I can't um, establish like this on a video in, in two seconds, because that wasn't the topic of my talk tonight, but something I believe very firmly, and I hope to write the article about it someday soon. I've promised it to someone, so maybe it will actually happen. And that is that I think um, Jewish women could read more than we've attributed the ability to read to them. Um, one of the reasons I think this is because we see women reading Yiddish uh, two or three centuries later, or less even, and Yiddish is in Hebrew letters. So women could read the Yiddish, but that doesn't mean they understood the Hebrew. I think stories were really told and they were told very, very often. One of the things I argue in my forthcoming book is the extent to which biblical models were influential in explaining practice. And you have to assume that women and men, and I think it's really all of medieval Jewish society um, or all of medieval society, because I think this is also true of Christian society, were hearing stories all the time. And in some cases, for example, in Sefer Hasidim, which is a well-known medieval composition that has over 400 stories, I think Eli Yassif counted there. Some of these stories are almost code words sometimes. You hear like in the story of, kind of like in the case of Bar Vichulda, the sister in the weasel, like in that story, and everybody knows what you mean. Um, so I think that we have a lot of telling of stories as part of sermons, as part of teaching, uh, and women in medieval Europe were usually taught by example. And when they were taught by example, that means they heard a story. So I think people are hearing stories all the time. What I would just add to that, and that's a central argument in my forthcoming book, is that we don't have to take literacy quite so literally. And that sounds like a pun that I just said right now. We don't have to say, take literacy quite so literally. You don't have to be able to read to be literate in some way, even if it's just by hearing and knowing the story and being able to repeat it. And there are places where you can see that these are stories that be, are being told again and again. I didn't relate that to rumors, but I would say that um, rumors are stories of that kind. And many of the stories that are kind of local medieval stories. And I'm always thrilled when I find a story in a text. And of course, I'm only reading a textual um, version of the story. But when I find a story in the text and it's clear that it's circulating. So I think rumors circulate and stories circulate. And I think medieval people um, often believe the rumors just like modern people often believe rumors. Um, much like they believe the stories they're told and the same way the biblical people walked on the street for medieval people and they believe they were real people and they had their stories so too they believe the rumors that circulated so we have a lot of really interesting things going on there so thank you for that question too. Thank you so um, we have also a question from one of our current fellows Louise Hex asking um, <laughs> Whether it's the case that in the stories that you related to us or the cases that you related to us, there was really quite little agency for the women um, involved. And so I guess enlarging on that a little bit, do, do, do you see that as true? Um, where is the agency for women here? And um, do you see it more in other aspects of um, Jewish life and, and Jewish law? Or are we just not hearing it in, in the way that you're describing? So it could be that the, thank you for that question. It could be in the examples I brought tonight, 
um, because I had to squeeze in, I wanted to get my five genres in, so I didn't give you so many examples, but I think we saw a great agency with the young woman who has this ring and belt brought to her. And she knows to hide her face, not to say a word and not to accept it. Um, so that's one example of agency that I think is very clear. She might not have been in charge of things when her parents made the agreement to marry. Maybe she changed her mind. That's agency too. Maybe she agreed to the marriage and then she changed her mind, but she refused to accept it. And she refuses in every way possible, not just the ring, also the belt. I think that's an example of agency. I think the young woman in the story had tremendous agency. And I think that is agency for me. And if you go back to Sefer Chassidim, which is another favorite example of mine that I didn't bring tonight. Um, but if you go back to Sefer Chassidim, there are quite a few stories of marriage there in which you see two kinds of agency. One kind of agency you see is young men and women who want to marry each other. And they kind of set up the match between them and then they go talk to their parents. So you think the parents are determining the match, but the story actually tells you that the children decided upon this and then they manipulated and negotiated the circumstances so their parents would agree. I think that's agency. The story is told in a traditional way of fathers making a decision. But when you read, not just between the lines, when you read the story, you discover that's not so. For me, one of the greatest shocks when I started studying the topic of marriage, and I hope that will be the topic of the book I'm writing now. Um, so I'm trying to finish that book finally on marriage. Um, was to see how many people were involved in these stories. You know, you think these are just the fathers and their poor kids are pawns in the story. That's not the case. And the other people who I wanna point out as agents, and I actually just gave a talk on this last week at the Medieval Academy of America. So anybody who's interested can go find the recording there, is mothers. How much agency mothers have. So we saw the mother sending the belt here. That's not something that shows tremendous agency, but if you read Sefer HaMaasim, and it's been translated recently into English um, in a version edited by Professor Rela Kushalevsky, a colleague of mine from Bar Ilan, a beautiful um, uh, translation and really a very, a, a wonderful addition. Um, you can see stories there in which the mothers have tremendous power and the father can want to make some match and they'll completely lead people in a different direction. There's a wonderful story there that Rela calls the bachelor, the poor bachelor and his cousin. So look for that story. And Louise, you would see there a fabulous example of a mother who takes over and changes everything. So I think women had a lot more agency than we give them credit for. And I think we've been kind of fooled by being used to read rabbinic formulations and by assuming that what the formulations say is what happened and not realizing that this is legal language being used by people to describe cases that don't actually describe the way they took place. Okay, wonderful. We just, as a, as a tiny little follow-up, we have a comment from the audience that this part of the discussion makes us maybe think about the, the Purim story and Esther in, in interesting ways. Um, so uh, one person, an anonymous person has asked you to talk a little bit more about your very first sentence um, or second sentence, which was that halakha is not necessarily synonymous with law and halachic with legal. So could you talk more about how they're different and why it matters to understand the difference and also why you choose to set that aside for the sake of this discussion. So I chose to set that aside for the sake of this discussion because I was given 40 minutes. And in the first version I wrote of the talk, I had like four pages um, that I tried to sort through this. Uh, because I decided to cut it out, I can't say that I polished those pages off perfectly because it was just a decision to cut. But I will say that halakha um, concerns issues not just of institutions and legals and rules about how different people relate to each other. It also concerns laws of how we relate to God, how we're supposed to practice our devotion to God. Um, and it really involves so much more than just legal, right? Um, and from that point of view, it's a very different system. Um, I would also say that within legal and halakha, we have another factor that was kind of looming there that I didn't talk about tonight and I omitted, and that's custom. And what is the difference between law and custom, what is the difference between halakha and minhag? These are also issues that different scholars far greater than me have debated for many decades already. And, um, and that is why I decided to leave it aside because I think with, in talking about everyday life, I'm allowing the legal, the halakhic, the custom, all to kind of blend in together. And the question is, when did people choose to go down one path and when did they choose to go down another path? When did they privilege what the law was 
When do they privilege what the custom was? When do they privilege the halakha, their everyday practices? And I think that's really complicated. Um, and I'll say that's complicated for understanding everyday Jewish life kind of within the confines of Jewish law or halakha. Um, it's also complicated when trying to understand how Jews made their decision when they were dealing with things on an everyday basis in their hometowns. Um, did they decide to go by the local law? Or did they go by halakha? How do they kind of try to make the two speak with each other? How do they change things? So I think there are a lot of different considerations we have to think about here. And I put it aside tonight, so I'm sorry to cop out on my answer as well. I'm putting it aside now, but I'm trying to explain why this is a complicated issue that really needs to be unpacked much further by someone who I think is more of a legal expert than I myself am. Excellent, that was clarifying, thank you. Um, all right, I would like to pass on a question from Micha Perry. Um, he asks, if you think it's worth looking into the differences between um, the observance of kashrut, presumably in, in a domestic setting, in practice, in contrast to in halachic discourse. So is kashrut a similarly fruitful domain of this kind of investigation to, to marriages? And are there sources for such a study? So instead of talking about kashrut, Micha, if you'll allow me, I would say food. In other words, I would turn us to kind of material culture of food. I think that's a really fruitful avenue um, for future research. Uh, one of my students wrote her MA, Ariela Lehmann. Um, she wrote her MA on how people prepared for Shabbat in the Middle Ages. And in doing so, she talked about the different foods people ate and how they prepared them. And she really was able through food to show not just when halacha took over and when people just went with local markets, local produce, things they had around them, local things that were accepted to eat. Um, but she also showed how food helped people establish their identity in interesting ways. And then I think this question becomes even more interesting because you can see that people make choices that do or don't have to do with halacha in different ways, but also have to do with their local circumstances. I, I'll refer here to something I wrote um, a while back, because it also is an example of where I tried to deal with this. Um, I have an article that came out in JSQ about uh, lighting Shabbat candles made out of tallow. According to the Mishnah, tallow is a substance you're not allowed to light your candles out of. In fact, in medieval Europe, when a Jew became a Christian and converted, some texts call these converts those tallow eaters. So you can see how this substance really represents something unkosher, you know, to the hilt. At the same time, until probably the late 13th or early 14th century, medieval Jews used tallow to light their Shabbat candles. And Rabbi Isaac or Zarua, who I quoted tonight extensively, says, I don't quite get it. Why are Jews using tallow? We're not supposed to be doing that. So you can see a really interesting kind of give and take happening. Tallow was a substance people had to light their houses. It was a cheap substance to light your house. At the same time, it's halakhically forbidden. Jews use tallow during the week, but what about Shabbat? So, so much is going on here with their identity, their affiliations, local markets, things that are accepted. By the 14th century, we know that Jews are using fish tallow. Um, and that's a way of kind of getting around it because fish are not, not kosher in the same way that other animals are not kosher. But Jews had tallow in their houses all the time. They used it for everyday purposes. So I think any food we take could be a nice example. That's just one example. And it's not the classic example of pig or anything we would think about. It's really uh, something that was an everyday lighting substance. So thank you for that question. Fish tallow sounds like it must have been um, quite odorous. All tallow was quite odorous. That's why yeah. in churches and often in shuls and synagogues, they only use wax. Another interesting substance to talk about because there are so many interesting questions about what do you do with candles that were originally in the church's possession, that were used in the church. Um, Ephraim Canterfogel in the Entangled Histories volume put out here by Penn after our 13th century year has a really interesting article exactly about some of those issues as well. So a couple of, of questions I think connected just through this material culture lens that we're now that we now find ourselves in um, about the weddings that we were looking at. Um, one person asked, uh, pointed out that in two of the images, the chuppah seems to be a cloth that's resting on their heads directly, if that it was typical, and if you know more about that. And related, um, were there typically rabbis serving as officiants 
um, what did a typical wedding look like, I guess, is the sort of broader question here. Okay, so those are two great questions. Um, what we know from the Sifre uh, Minagim, from the custom books from the period, is that very often the Ashkenazi Khatan would have a talit, and what you see the cloth is the talit on both their heads. So it's not just a chuppah, it's not a chuppah, which we also have in some of the illuminations. It's really the talit um, on their heads. And uh, that's when Ashkenazic men would receive talitot, which is still the custom among, among some Ashkenazim today, even under a chuppah. Um, and as far as the rabbis here, I would pull on the work of two scholars, um, Elliot Horowitz, may he rest in peace, and also Yisrael Yuval, may he live a long life. Um, I think that uh, Yuval showed in his first book, Chachamim B'doram, that was published only in Hebrew, the extent to which a rabbi became a figure who officiated at weddings um, as the Middle Ages progressed, so by the 14th, 15th century. And Elliot, together with Esther Cohen in their article, showed how this is really parallel to what was going on in Christian society. Um, if I can just add one thing that has to do with my work and wasn't in the talk tonight, is tonight I really focused on marriage and I was looking kind of inside Jewish society, although I kept on shining out to the medieval Jewish, to the medieval Jewish Christian context. But I think that Elliot Horowitz's and Esther Cohen's work is really um, fantastic in how it showed us that similar processes were going on in both societies at the same time. And I think that's something we really have to keep in mind. I tried to do that kind of in small ways tonight, but I think that's a way to expand this scope um, as well. And I'll just be really parochial for a moment and note that so many of the people that you're mentioning uh, the work of have been fellows at the CAT Center or connected with the CAT Center or with JQR. And it's so wonderful to be sort of among um, a community of, of friends and scholars. Um, switching gears just a little bit then, um, we have a question from uh, Rita Lauer, who asks um, a question that is, is um, moving towards a broader sphere than Ashkenaz, um, because she's a Mediterraneanist, Mediterraneanist. So she says, when you talk about the five genres of sources for analysis that you brought, do you think this is something that can or should be extrapolated for other areas in the Jewish Middle Ages? Is there something unique in doing this kind of work for the Ashkenazic milieu, or is it is it a proxy for, for broader context? And then she asks, are, are Ashkenazicists like you um, at a loss at all because other kinds of sources that exist, for example, in the Mediterranean, like um, evidence of Jewish engagement with the secular courtroom don't exist as much for, for the Ashkenazi lands? Okay, so hi, Rina, it's great to know that you're there. And um, I would say that what I'm talking about, I don't think is at all only for people who study medieval Ashkenaz. I think that part of what we have to learn to do as historians is to branch out into as many genres as we can, whatever exists for the areas that we study. Um, and I really feel um, the work I've done over the past years has made me believe that any study that's done only on one type of source um, is a study that you will have to question much more afterwards. And the more evidence we have from different sources makes our findings kind of have more gravitas, but also gives us a better perspective on what kind of distortions the genre itself might bring into our readings and the ways we're understanding things. Just to give, I wanna answer the question in two ways, just to give one interesting example from tonight. Um, I think what's really interesting that for me, when I first realized it was to say, okay, we have the responsa that's kind of very halachic with this very kind of legal phrasing. Then we have moral exempla, like let's say we have in Sefer Hasidim, I kind of mentioned that now in the Q&A, and we have the stories, right? And then we have Rabbi Isaac of Shinon and his formula. These guys are all the elite who are writing. We have all these different men telling the story. They're kind of one and the same, right? They could have interchangeably written any of these different sources. But what we see is even that same person, when they change genres, they tell the story differently. It's kind of like when you tell a story um, on the street and then you'll tell a story as part of a lecture, you'll tell it differently. Or if you tell a story to your kid and then you tell a story later on to your peer, you'll tell the story differently. So I think that part of what the genres enable us is even if we can't get beyond the elite, which has been my dream, even if we can't actually get there by hearing, because we only have the sources that these people wrote who were the elite, by seeing the different genres, we can hear them in different ways and they resonate with each other. I'm not saying that they don't stay true to themselves. The same person might write the same thing in four different genres, but he'll say it differently. And by these nuances, we can learn a lot. So I think that's really important for any scholar 
um, or for any historian. I'm a historian, I'll speak only for social historians, but I think that's really important. Um, you said, you, I, I'm gonna jump on the second part of Rena's question uh, to say something really, really important, which is I think it's a myth that Jews didn't use the secular courts to the same extent in Ashkenaz, to the same extent they did elsewhere. Um, and recently, uh, two of my students, can you tell I'm really proud of my students? So two of my students, Aviad Doron and Nurit Dermer, um, who are working mainly on 14th century sources, have been finding more and more Jew Jews in local courts. So Nurit is working in Paris, and Aviad's main work on the courts has been in Frankfurt. Uh, Nurit has found court cases, these are mainly cases between Jews and Christians, of course, it's not Jews bringing Jews to court, that happens much more rarely, but there are so many cases that people have just overlooked or not found or not studied. So Nurit has worked on cases that came before the Palois in Paris, whereas Avia has worked on Krakauer's Regesta of um, the court cases from the markets in Frankfurt. There are over 10,000 of them for the 14th century. And she's been able to mine all of this using big data methods and using digital humanities and to figure out who was doing business with who, um, when Jews were repeaters with Christians and all kinds of other interesting things. Read their articles. Um, they were both published in a volume of medieval encounters that came out just a few months ago. So I invite everybody here to go and read some of their work and see how this, these medieval courts are courts in which you can find Jews and contrary kind of to um, the myths we read in scholarship, Jews were very active there. Avia even found, and you'll see it in her article because she quotes it, she even found a halachist who we know who said you should not go to, to non-Jewish courts in the court. So he says in the Shailos and Shuvot, you should not be going to non-Jewish courts, but then you find him in the court. So that's really nice to see that he too is going to the non-Jewish court and doing his business there. So I'll just send you for, like for I'm giving you some bibliography to go and read those things. Fantastic. I can't wait to see how the field changes and adapts to, to incorporate all of this new work that your team is doing. Um, what, another one of our current fellows, Chaya Halberstam, has asked a question about storytelling and law that I think follows up well on what you were just saying. So often when stories are told and retold, um, it's precisely things like legal details that don't remain stable. She writes, so is knowledge so-called knowledge of the law, a somewhat fluid thing then, depending on which versions of stories you've heard? Okay, I think I think that's a fantastic question. And I think that part of the project that I did together with Rela Kushilevsky, who edited the Sefer Maasim, and I wrote a historic epilogue um, to her version. So I was part of the project all along, was to say this in a different way. So I'll just rephrase it a little bit to make the point. So one of the things that we found in Sefer Maasim, Sefer Maasim has 60 some odd tales, depending on how you count them. And some of them are medieval stories that we don't have in previous uh, sources, but some of them are stories that are retold that we know from the Talmud, from the Mishnah, or even from the Bible. And the stories are retold and you can look at the versions and um, the whole department of uh, Jewish literature, Hebrew literature at Bar Ilan University for many, many years has had a project ongoing to looking at these versions over time. They call it thematologia, thematology and looking at how the themes change. And I think you can tell so much more than legal knowledge. You can tell so many things about culture by reading the story and seeing how you tell the story in a new way. Uh, to give a very modern example, how do we as modern parents tell our children stories about princesses and princes that maybe we heard 30 or 40 or 50 years ago and today it doesn't quite fit, right? The way uh, we would like to tell our children stories, we change those details and think of how much people could learn about us if the princess was not beautiful, but she was really smart and she knew how to build things, right? Um, so that would be a way we retold a story about a princess long ago who would just be gorgeous or beautiful or, or quiet and always did what everybody wanted her to do. So I think looking at stories and how the details change, we've learned things like that from Robert Darnton and his great cat massacre many years ago. I think that's really interesting. And I think legal knowledge is one of those cases. In other words, legal knowledge is a great example of how details change in stories and when we retell them, when we, we see different versions, we can learn about what's changing on the ground. Because sometimes the, the, the point of law that a story hinges on will change or be lost, right? And then the story doesn't make sense to the listener anymore. And that, that's the case in, in a, a lot of those stories um, in Sefer al -Masim. Um, all right, so I don't want to exhaust you. Um, you've been answering questions for a good half hour, so we'll just do a, a couple more. Um, 
I have in, in great academic tradition, both a comment and a question from Jonathan Boyarin. Um, the comment is um, that many of your insights about agency and contingency and larger frameworks may apply very well, um, mutatis mutandis, to the dynamics of contemporary Haredi or traditionalist communities as well. So whether you want to speak to that or not, I'll just put that out there. Um, the question is a is a particular one, and I will say there are a number of questions that have been submitted that are really like asking about the details of the stories. Did they mean this? Did they mean that? Is this what happened? Um, and I don't think that we probably have time to get into them, but I do want to point out that there's this impulse, right, that when we hear the stories, we want to talk about the details, and that's what stories do for us. So thank you for everybody who's, who's put those questions in, but I'll just read this one. Um, Boyaran is asking if it is actually clear from the response um, to the Orzaruas question that the recommended procedure was marriage followed by divorce. He wonders if it might rather be read as a recommendation of marriage or failing that the granting of a document of divorce so that other people will think the woman is no longer engaged if they're convinced she ever was, right? Um, and he says, this latter point especially seems to be reinforced by the idea that if a get is given, it shouldn't bar her from marrying a Kohen. Um, so she shouldn't be legally treated as a divorcee. So kind of picky and details of the story, but, but interesting to get into, right? Because how are you, how are you interpreting? How are you figuring out what's really going on in these complicated texts? Okay, so um, about modern Haredim, I would say that, uh, Usually I say to people when they ask me those questions, I'm a medievalist um, and I don't know how to comment on modern society. Um, I think some of these insights are applicable to any society, including modern societies. And I think you have to know the nuances of the society you're studying or to be able to do it wisely. So I will leave modern Haredi society aside because I don't think I know those nuances um, well enough, but I think there's wonderful work being done out there that shows you those nuances um, in different ways. Um, I don't know if I'm on top of that literature and the, the most recent work done in that area. Um, as far as the Shailan Chuva, uh, there was a point in my versions of the talk that I had another response that had a similar case. Um, and I was going to try to bring two to show you how common it was. And then I cut that out, of course, in interest of time. Um, but I would say that there it's the same question, but even more pointed. The woman was engaged to Cohen. It's a response in the Maharam of Rothenburg. The woman was engaged to a Cohen. She was not engaged, I'm sorry. She was Mishudechet. She was promised to a Cohen. They had agreed on the marriage. She wanted to marry this Cohen. And then to her house, in her house, appeared someone who the text called a Paritz, right? So a thug of some sort. Um, often people who do unacceptable sexual things are called Pritzim in a lot of medieval texts. So the Paritz comes, he hands her a ring, he sticks it on her finger, he doesn't say anything, and later he says to her, honey, by the way, we're married. Now they have to ask the people who are there who are witnesses what's going on. And one of the people said, well, I saw him take the ring, but I didn't see him put it on her finger. So does it count as marriage, doesn't count as marriage? But the problem is that the whole community says she was married. Now, this is even more tricky, right? Because, uh, she was supposed to marry a Cohen, so what do you do? So the question there is again complicated. I think that what to me in the Orza Rua case, I'm going back to that for a minute, just to give you an example of how specific it can be and how the question that Jonathan is asking, and thank you for the question, Jonathan, is really um, one that I think was pertinent and was an actual question sometimes. Going back to the Orza Rua, what I found mind boggling about the case the more I read it was not just the detail, I love the detail, being able to imagine the belt and the ring and everything being sent. But also, why was Isaac asking this question? And why is it being sent halfway across Europe, right? It's clear to him that this woman isn't married. It's clear to him that she wasn't betrothed. It's clear to him this isn't halachic. He has to turn to his teacher. His teacher answers him. He's pretty clear about things. And he says, she isn't betrothed, but maybe you can do this. Then he sends it to two of his friends and they say to him in a much less um, I'd say in a much clearer way, Isaac, forget it. She's not married. She's not betrothed. There's no obligation here. Forget this rumor. This rumor doesn't count. Go to Masechet or Shana. You can read about different kinds of rumors and how you count rumors. And he still is insisting on asking. He sends a question to his teacher. He sends it to his two friends afterwards. So you can see how strong the voices from society were 
that we're saying this woman is married. So I don't know if they're pretending, not pretending, if everybody knows she's just getting divorced, but that seems a pretty extreme thing to me to say this young woman should be divorced and she should be a divorcee, whatever that meant from medieval society, which is something I think we have to learn more about. I don't think anybody's done a serious study on what it means to be divorced in medieval Ashkenaz or in medieval anything at all. I think that's really important, especially in medieval Ashkenaz, I would say, when Christians aren't getting divorced. So I'll stop there, but you can see that this question has kind of gotten me started because I think it's really, really interesting. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, we had somebody, asked in the in the questions for a, a talk about mothers and now I think we definitely also have a call for a for a talk about divorcees. Um just one one final um question and and it may just be a question of clarification. I don't know if there's anything you know more more to be said about it, but one person is asking um pointing out that Christian women in the Middle Ages theoretically could not be forced to marry against their will. They had to positively agree to marriage without compulsion. They're asking if the same was true um, for Jewish women, if women were forced to marry against their will, even against um, whatever uh, theoretical legal restriction there might have been. Can you, can you address that? Okay, so I, I'll make two points in answer to that. Thank you for that question. The first thing I would say is that Christian women, according to church law, and marriage became uh, one of the sacraments in the Middle Ages, in the 13th century, were supposed to agree. They were supposed to agree. The agreement was supposed to be made. It was a mutual agreement. It was a conjugal agreement. Both sides had to agree. We know that from the movies, right? Do you take this man? Do you take this woman? Etc. And they were supposed to affirm this in present tense. There are wonderful court cases in which people say, well, he didn't affirm it in present tense. He said in the future, he said in the past, whatever he said, he didn't say it in present tense. So it's not a valid marriage. Richard Helmholtz already wrote about this in the seventies in his book on marriage. So I think that's a really interesting example. However, the point I was trying to make tonight in my talk is that sometimes even without those agreements, women were considered married because they were given or betrothed because they were given a ring. So I think you can see the same issue I was talking about in Jewish society, in Christian society, that officially you had to agree. Officially, you have to say and she has to receive the ring on her finger, um, even without acquiescing in that way. Although according to halacha, women are also supposed to agree, right? Um, in some way to the marriage. Um, but in Christian society, we see the same problem. In other words, we have marriages being claimed to be marriages, even when they weren't agreed upon. So that's the first point um, I would make uh, in, in this context. The second thing is, sorry, there was a second part of that question. Anne, can you repeat that? Um, it was a question about whether it was the case that in Jewish marriage, women had to, I think you answered both part. Okay, I think I, if I answer both part, that's good. I know there was another point that I, want, I think I wanted to make, but that's okay, we'll leave it now. I think I think that's that's great. I, I We have really asked a lot of you. Um, so I think we'll close it here. And I want to just end by thanking you again, Ali Shavas, so much for a really illuminating and entertaining um, hour. And also thank our hosts and our sponsors, um, the Cat Center, Steve Weitzman, Natalie Dorman, Tom Katz, Rita Copeland, and all of our attendees. It was great seeing so many current and past fellows and people that we know from other Cat Center contexts in the audience. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Eli Shava. Thank you very much.